I'll be talking about diffractive electron mirrors in scanning electron microscopes or SEMs. Uh, today I'll be talking quite a bit about electron mirrors, so I thought it might be a good idea to cover the very basics of electron mirrors. Electron mirrors are actually fairly similar to normal light mirrors. I mean, for one thing, um, a, a beam of light could be reflected by a flat mirror, uh, whereas a beam of electrons could be reflected by an electron mirror. Um, there are some differences, however. In the case of a flat mirror, we have a piece of glass covered with some metal, and that's enough to reflect um, particles of uh, light or photons. But to reflect electrons, what we need is a um, negatively biased electrode and a counter electrode to create a field between the two. And because this, um, the, the bias to the, to the electrode is negative, and if, as long as that, um, that uh, bias is more stronger or larger than the energy of the incoming electron, the incoming electron actually slows down, stops, and goes through a round, um, roundabout and, and gets reflected. Um, one of the differences, the other, uh, another one of the differences uh, between electron mirrors and light mirrors, because of the, the presence of that uh, counter electrode, because of the sharp edges of the counter electrode, there's always some um, fringe fields um, in yellow. Uh, I'm showing them in yellow lines here. Um, and these fringe fields cause the reflected beam to diverge. And, um, and with this simple design of an electron mirror, this, is always, this will always happen. The, the reflected electron will diverge. Um, to get around this problem, we have to go to a little more complex electron mirror geometries. This simplest case wouldn't work. And one of those um, geometries is a tetrode electron mirror. Uh, in this case, we're using four electrodes. Um, again, by tuning the, the voltage on these, um, on these uh, electrodes, we get to reflect the electron. And not only that, we can also control the divergence angle of the reflected beam. We can actually have it focused or parallel if we want to. Um, so let's go over some of the more some of the well-established applications of electron mirrors, um, one of, two of which are mirror electron microscopy and low energy electron microscopy. In both cases, the sample is held at a uh, negative bias um, on the bottom, on, on, the, on the surface of an electron mirror. And as the incoming electron beam comes in, uh, in case of the mirror electron microscopy, the, the bias is actually large enough that the electron would never directly interact with the sample. It, it slows down somewhere above the, the surface of the sample, and it gets reflected above the sample. Uh, in case of the low energy electron microscopy, or LEAM, um, the, elect the, the bias is not quite as large, but still uh, fairly um, enough to slow down the electron significantly, so that the electron basically gently lands on the top surface of the sample, uh, and then backscatters. And then those backscattered electrons are collected and imaged. Um, the advantage of these techniques is uh, there are two advantages. One is the fact that um, uh, if the sample is very sensitive to energetic beams of electron, in this case, we're actually only um, very gently interacting with them. And the other, the other advantage is that um, uh, they're very sur surface sensitive because we're not um, interacting with the bulk of these samples, only with the either, in the case of the mirror electron microscopy, not even with the, the actual sample, only above it. So we can only see a kind of a contour of the sample. And in the case of the LEAM, uh, we can only see the very outermost surface of the samples. Um, another well-established application of electron mirrors is, um, is their use in spherical and chromatic aberration correction. Um, Correction for spherical and chromatic aberration in electron microscopy is actually a very notoriously difficult problem to solve. And it's been done. And one of the ways to do it is uh, through the use of electron mirrors. So you can imagine a beam of electron coming in um, from, the, from the left. And uh, this beam could be aberrated because the, it went through some electron lenses. And then it could get separated using some, um, some magnetic prisms and get directed towards an electron mirror. And this electron mirror it has um, a potential, ha has, has its um, mirror surface engineered such that it produces uh, potential surfaces with positive and negative uh, curvatures. These positive and negative curvatures in turn produce positive and negative um, uh, chromatic and sp spherical and chromatic aberration uh, coefficients. And, 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 and with this, we can actually uh, correct for the counteract the aberration that was produced by electron lenses prior to this mirror. And then when the beam is corrected, we can reflect it back up, and then it gets, um, gets, uh, could be used for, um, for uh, microscopy, um, free of uh, the aberrations to, to an extent. 
So these were some of the well-established applications of electron mirrors, but the point of my talk today is actually the use of electron mirrors in um, a, a newer concept called uh, quantum electron microscopy, or QEM, which is a joint effort between MIT, Delft, Stanford, and, er and Erlangen. Um, so elec quantum electron microscopy is a novel electron microscopy technique that proposes to reduce or eliminate um, electron, beam, electron beam damage to biological samples. And the way it propose, proposes to do this is by um, coupling an electron inside a cavity. And a cavity could be this region uh, in be bound between two electron mirrors. Uh, by coupling an electron inside this cavity and have it go through many um, arbitrarily low damage interactions with, um, with a sample, and then at the end, uh, a measurement could be done on this, on this electron, and, uh, and, and uh, we can obtain an image of the sample that way. There are quite a few subtleties involved with the physics of this kind of measurement, which I will not get into. I would urge you to um, take a look at this paper by uh, Peter Crewitt et al. Um, it goes over some of those subtleties and also goes over some of the other designs of uh, quantum electron microscope. Um, now, let's go back to the use of electron mirror in quantum electron microscopy. Uh, if we only focus right now for the, to the, on, on the mirror at, uh, on the bottom of that electron resonant cavity, uh, the first requirement for, of an electron mirror in QEM is reflection. Obviously, we want the mirror to reflect the electron beam. Uh, but let's see what happens if we have an, a flat mirror uh, doing this reflection for us. A flat mirror would uh, reflect the diver diverged beam and uh, reflect it back up towards the sample. And even further diverge the beam. However, uh, the second requirement is refocusing. The idea here is that we want, we want the sample plane to be in focus, both for the, com the beam coming down from the objective lens of whatever device we're using, let's say an SEM, and also we want it to be in focus um, when the beam gets reflected. This could be done by uh, placing a lens or electron lens on top of this mirror so that you can imagine the beam goes down, gets reflected, and gets refocused back on the sample plane. That brings us to the third requirement of uh, the electron mirror in, uh, in QEM, which is diffraction, or more broadly, a method by which to, to split the electron beam. And the idea here is we want the, the electron, um, we, want, we want the beam splitter to, to split the wave function of the electron into, into different states or paths and have the electron uh, go through this cavity through many round trips um, while it exists as a superposition of all these, um, all these other states um, uh, until, it until it interacts with the sample. So you can imagine the beam comes down, it gets diffracted, and then also reflected and refocused on the sample plane again. So in this case, I'm only showing um, one order of diffraction. I'm showing only uh, minus one and plus one uh, orders, and uh, including the zeroth order. So the idea here is that um, if this sample uh, breaks the superposition uh, between uh, these uh, electron states, then we can get an idea of the nature of the sample. Uh, for example, we can get an idea of how, how strongly does it scatter electrons or how much it absorbs electrons and, uh, at a particular pixel of that sample. And when we move that sample around, then we can produce a binary map of, uh, of that sample. Um, I'll talk more about diffraction um, in a bit. Right now, let's go back to uh, the first two requirements of uh, the electron mirror in QEM, reflection and refocusing. Uh, just to, produce, just to uh, take a look at these two requirements, uh, we developed this uh, proof of principle um, experiment uh, inside, an, uh, inside a conventional field emission SEM um, to, to look at these two requirements. Uh, first, we placed a sample uh, very close to the optical axis of the ob objective lens and also placed um, a, a tetrode mirror. I mentioned in the beginning, a tetrode mirror is the kind of mirror that um, gives us better control over the, the divergence angle of the reflected beam. And uh, we placed this tetrode mirror, um, plus lens, I should say, uh, such that its, uh, its optical axis overlaps with the optical axis of the objective lens. So you can imagine it, have, having this uh, setup, when we start to scan the top surface of the sample, we would produce a top surface um, we would produce an image of the top surface. In this, in this case, I'm showing it on the right side here. That's just an image of a silicon cantilever that we were using as our sample. Uh, that, that image was produced by uh, scanning the top surface of the sample. Uh, so you can imagine we can scan the top surface, but at some point when we scan away from this top surface, the electron actually gets to go down, gets 
toward, goes towards the mirror, gets reflected and refocused on the bottom surface of the sample. And just as um, a focused beam on the top surface was producing an image of the top surface of the sample, a focused beam on the bottom surface produces a bottom, an, an image of the bottom surface of the sample. So in this case, you can see an image of the top surface produced uh, simultaneously as the image of the bottom surface is produced in the same um, scanning of the same frame. Um, and, in, and, and, in, and in both cases, uh, the in-lens detector was used to collect the, the secondary electrons to be able to image these samples. The secondary the, the in-lens detector is, uh, of course, uh, positively biased. That's why these electrons get sucked up towards the column and get, def get uh, detected there. Um, let's, uh, before I go further into these results, I'll show some more in a bit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the experimental setup that we used to conduct these experiments. Um, this is the kind of um, um, electrodes that we're using for, to, to, con to construct a tetrode mirror. Uh, these are stainless steel, stainless steel uh, plates uh, with some holes in them. Uh, the white uh, spheres that you see in, in these, um, these electrodes, they, they are um, in insulators and they are spherical spacers. Uh, they serve two purposes. One is to insulate these um, stainless steel plates from each other and also to laterally fix the whole structure in place. Um, and it's, it's, they are all assembled on top of this uh, aluminum piece which get mounted inside an SEM. Uh, for the sample, we're using these uh, TEM grids. Uh, we're just basically using these uh, silicon cantilevers on these TEM grids, uh, just as our sample. Um, and this is the whole assembly inside the SEM. Um, so this, uh, this part, the, 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 you see the stack of uh, electrodes that are uh, behaving as the mirror and the lens, um, assembled inside on top of a three-axis alignment stage, uh, on top of which we, you see the sample on a TEM uh, mount which is also mounted on a five-axis uh, nano stage or nano positioner. Um, and the idea here is that we want independent um, alignment of the sample. That's why we mount it on top of a separate stage. And um, this is the objective lens of the, of the SEM. Obviously, the chamber is open now. So that's why uh, the sample and the mirror are not underneath the um, objective lens. When we close the chamber of the SEM, everything will be underneath um, the sample and the mirror would be underneath the objective lens. And further uh, or finer alignments could be done with the three-axis alignment stage and with the five-stage five or five-axis um, nanopositioner. So, to, so we have a set um, distance between these electrodes and uh, the, a certain aperture for these electrodes. Uh, those are our design criteria, um, and they're fixed. So having those numbers, then we ran some electron trajectory simulations to find out the kind of potentials we need to apply to these electrodes to be able to create a round trip trajectory. For, so in this case, electron starts here at 26 millimeters from, from the mirror surface at uh, 2 kV of energy. And it goes through a, pa an, a, an, a symmetric path. It gets uh, reflected by the mirror and then comes back um, and the idea is that it will be focused here on the sample plane and then, uh, and then completes a, a, tra a, tra a symmetric trajectory. We've done this for two different um, uh, convergence, convergence angles um, just to uh, mimic what would happen in a, in a, in a scan uh, because the, uh, the, the angle of the electron changes while we scan the top and top surface of the sample. And, uh, and as you can see, the energy of the electron is 2 kV, so we had to set the mirror potential and on the, the farthest left electrode was set to somewhere above that, minus 2080 in this case, just to ensure that the electron doesn't strike the, the surface of the mirror. We want the electron to reflect without interacting directly with the mirror. So now let's take a look at what would happen. So this is, this is what, what, what I see on the computer connected to the SEM. This is the, the surface of the top, um, this is the top surface of the, the cantilever. So this image is produced when the blue beam here is scanning the top surface. Now let's take a look and see what happens as I turn on the mirror, the blue electrode here in, on the image on the left. And you see the, the center, central region is getting brighter and that's because more of the electrons are getting reflected back up towards the uh, in-lens detector. Um, and as, as I uh, tune the yellow and the green electrodes, you see that um, a, an image of the bottom surface of the um, cantilever is forming. And that's because I'm focusing the reflected beam on, on the bottom surface of this, this, this cantilever. So this is the top surface of the cantilever, and this is the bottom surface of the cantilever that we can see by 
um, scanning a, reflected, a focused reflected beam on the bottom surface of the cantilever. Um, so, th I mean, um, when I um, further tune these electrodes, I can uh, produce a fairly uh, much sharper image of the bottom image of the bottom surface. Again, um, everything you see on the right side of this image is a direct SEM image of the top surface, whereas everything you see on the left side is um, the beam going through a reflection and refocusing on the bottom surface of the sample. So if I turn off these electrodes, the image on the left would actually disappear. We would only see the image on the right. So one observation here is that there's point symmetry, and uh, this is what we, you would expect from an electron trajectory that's symmetric. And uh, if you follow these dashed blue lines, you can find uh, the intersection would show us where the optical axis is. And uh, here's just a better uh, view of the point symmetry, just showing it in action. Uh, the top image is the cantilever, and it's mounted on a um, nano positioner. And as I move it, you see every motion of that top cantilever is uh, mirrored by the, by the uh, mirror, mirror um, image. Uh, when I move it, um, when I move the actual cantilever to the left, the, the mirror image goes to the right, as you would expect. So just to take a, just to have a better idea of the resolution of this kind of imaging, we milled out three lines using a focused ion beam on the bottom surface of this cantilever. So again, on the right, you see the actual top surface image, but you don't see any lines because this is the top surface, and we milled out those lines um, on the bottom surface. So you see those lines in the in the reflected image, uh, and if I zoom, if I magnify it a little bit better, more, and you can see better what kind of resolutions we're dealing with. Um, so resolution is quite a bit below one micron, more 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 uh, more likely about um, six to seven hundred nanometer resolution. Um, but the other observation you can make here is that the fact that only in a small region of this um, of this field of view uh, is the resolution fairly sharp, or is the image fairly sharp. Uh, anywhere else, uh, you see these uh, blurry edges and uh, some stigmation, and uh, overall not a good resolution. And that's because of the fact that um, only close to the optical axis are the uh, are the um, spherical and chromatic aberrations small. As we go farther away from the optical axis, uh, the, optical, the, the spherical aberration actually gets pretty strong and distorts the image or reduces the resolution. And uh, the other point we have to take into account is the fact that anytime we have a flat electron mirror uh, that is not um, aberration corrected, uh, it actually has quite a bit of um, sp spherical aberration, which um, in this case clearly is distorting the image. So let's go over some of the sources of, um, of uh, limited resolution. Um, I mentioned spherical and chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is usually uh, the big one in, for, for scanning electron microscopy. But in this case, because we are reflecting the beam off of a flat uh, mirror, spherical aberration is actually uh, the, 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 pro problem, the problematic issue here. Another problem uh, which is less important but nonetheless is important is alignment limitations. We're basically aligning these um, these uh, stainless steel pla stainless steel plates by hand using um, using um, spherical spacers, and um, every time there's some uncertainty in these alignments. And the fact that we're using these um, commercially available uh, plates, uh, they uh, obviously would have their um, machining tolerances and some. Um, the, the sizes don't um, perfectly match, which could produce some uh, non-uniformity in the fields that they produce. And that, what, that translates into limited resolution. Um, voltage instability uh, is sometimes an issue. The potential we apply to these electrodes um, at high fields um, are sometimes unstable. Um, and, um, I mean, arcing happens. And uh, finally, mechanical vibration is sometimes a problem, um, especially when magnification is higher than this. So now um, that you've seen the results of the two, the, the, um, now, now that you've seen the first two requirements uh, getting uh, satisfied, the reflection and refocusing getting satisfied, uh, let's go back to diffraction. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the third requirement is diffraction or a, or a beam splitter. And the idea here is that um, by incorporating a uh, topographical grating into the mirror, we can produce a uh, phase grating, which, uh, which could act as a lossless beam splitter. Uh, and this is important. Lossless is important um, in, for, this, for this application of uh, quantum electron microscopy. Uh, now let's take a look and see how 
a topographical grading with a negative bias applied to a topographical grading can, can diffract um, an incoming electron. The way it works is that that electrode uh, with the negative bias would produce sinusoidal potentials on top of it. And an incoming electron, an incoming plane wave electron um, coming down and interacting with these sinusoidal potentials, it undergoes a modulation in phase shift because different parts of the beam would see different um, amplitudes of this um, sinusoidal potential or different regions of the sinusoidal potential and therefore they go through a uh, modulation in phase shift and in far field this modulation in phase shift leads to uh, constructive and destructive interferences and would, uh, would lead to diffraction. Uh, one way to get, a, get an estimate of this mo modulation phase shift is to use um, WKB approximation. Here I'm showing it on the, in the equation. So it's, uh, the WKB approximation says the, the phase shift as a function of x, which in this case is the lateral direction, uh, is equal to the integral from zr to z0. zr is uh, the surface on which, or the height at which the electron gets reflected. Uh, in, other, uh, in other words, it's the potential, um, it's, the, it's the voltage surface or potential surface that is uh, equal to the, um, or equivalent to the en energy of the incoming electron. And uh, Z0 is uh, the, the height uh, of, the, of the counter electrode. Um, 2 pi divided by uh, lambda Z, and lambda Z is, a, is the de Broglie wavelength of the electron, um, and it's a function of Z or the uh, the, the longitudinal or direction of propagation because as the electron is coming down it slows down because, uh, because of the mirror and as it slows down its uh, wavelength or its de Broglie wavelength increases. Um, and this is actually the problem because at some point uh, when, the, uh, when this de Broglie wavelength um, approaches infinity then we no longer can use WKB approximation. This approximation is not a valid approximation um, for, uh, for classical turning points. Um, and, and therefore we actually can't use WKB approximation near the mirror. Um, one way to fix this problem is to break up the region into different regions, uh, region 1, 2, 3 in this case. Region 1 is where there's no potential and we can assume V equals 0 and we can just use the plane wave solution for the, for the electron. Uh, region 2 is where the electron begins to feel this potential ramping up and it's a, it's a slowly varying potential and its, uh, its slope is constant so we can actually use WKB approximation. Um, region 3 is the region where we can no longer assume these potential surfaces are flat, they're actually sinusoidal in shape because of the presence of this um, topographical grating or diffractive mirror. So the potentials are no longer simply flat, they are sinusoidal and also the electron goes through a, a turning point. In this case uh, I'm showing um, that example of a turning point with the red uh, potential surface. So the electrons going through the turning port, we can no longer use the WKB approximation. Uh, so one way to deal with this region is to break it up into or discretize it and actually solve the, the 1D uh, Schrodinger, time independent Schrodinger equation um, to, so to, find the, to find the solution for this region. And when we do that, uh, the solution we get is, um, is the phase shift of the, of the electron as a function of x, which is in this case it's the vertical direction. So we get the phase shift of the electron for one period in this case, we can use periodic boundary condition. For one period of the, of the grading we get, a, we get a dependence of the phase on the lateral direction x. And this is after the electron inter interacts with these uh, potential surfaces and when it comes back that's the phase shift. And this is not the complete solution because we, all, we still have to then take this um, phase shift and translate it to see what happens in, in far field. But this is the, this is the potential, um, this is the uh, phase modulation which ultimately leads to uh, diffraction. Uh, another subtlety involved with, um, uh, with uh, topographic grading is, is uh, the field, the electric field between um, the mirror surface and the counter electrode. Um, if this, if this electric field is, um, is small, then uh, these sinusoidal potentials are actually pretty separate, pretty far from each other. And what that means is when we have a non-ideal source of electron, which um, obviously all sources of electron have some spread in energy, 
we can't um, get around that problem. Um, in this case, I'm showing the spread of energy with two different beams um, of two different colors, red and yellow. So red is the more energetic part of the beam. So this is all the same beam, but part, parts of it have higher energy, parts of it has lower energy. I'm showing um, the, the red region, uh, the red uh, arrow shows the part of that beam with a lower, with a higher energy. So you can imagine that incoming electron can penetrate deeper through the potential surfaces and get reflected on a potential surface that's closer to the mirror. Whereas the yellow beam that's um, lower energy or, or slower, that that beam can penetrate shallower in these potential surfaces and get, gets reflected on a potential surface a little farther away from the surface of the mirror. So the result is the fact that uh, because these par different parts of the beam get reflected off of a different surface uh, potential, potential surface, uh, the problem is that they go through different uh, uh, phase modulations. And that causes, uh, uh, that leads to a very inefficient um, beam splitter because different parts of the beam end up at different uh, diffraction spots um, and, not, um, and not the same diffraction spot, which means, uh, which means uh, this kind of, um, this, which means having low electric field between the mirror and the, poten and the counter electrode leads to an inefficient uh, beam splitter. However, if, so you can see, actually see the, uh, it's, it's best shown in this plot on the left. Um, the x-axis is the electric field. And you can see uh, for the ideal case, which is if we had a monochromatic um, electron, which is impossible, but if we had one, um, doesn't matter what the electric field is, the, the modulation in phase is always constant. Um, but that's not the case because we, uh, if we assume an, a spread of energy of uh, plus and minus uh, one electron volt, you can see at, uh, at, low, energy, at low electric fields, there's uh, quite a bit of spread in the amount of uh, phase modulation we get, which leads to an inefficient beam splitter. But if we go to higher electric fields, what happens is that these uh, potential surfaces get uh, squeezed together and become very close to each other. And therefore, the phase modulation that uh, different parts of the electron go, go through uh, would, be, would be quite small or that would be uh, close to the ideal case and the efficiency would go high. So you can imagine it would be uh, preferable to work at higher electric fields um, to, to have uh, higher efficiency. But the problem is there's a limit to how high we can go with the electric field. And the limit is arcing. At some point, when the electric field between these electrodes is too high, um, um, electrical breakdown happens or arcing happens. And in, in this case, uh, in our case, we were actually limited to about um, 10 kV per millimeter. And anywhere above that, we would have arcing. So now let's take a look at the fabrication of these, um, these uh, or the fabricated um, diffractive mirrors. This is, um, um, this is an SEM image of the cross-section of these, uh, these topographical gratings. They were fabricated on a one-inch um, silicon wafer using uh, interference lithography, and in particular, uh, using the Lloyd's mirror setup. Uh, the pitch of this uh, diffraction grating is uh, 500 nanometers, and the height is approximately, the height of these walls uh, is approximately uh, one micron. So what we did was we fabricated this diffraction grating on the silicon uh, wafer and basically stuck it on a on the on one of those uh, stainless steel plates, which is in this case is the mirror plate, the the bottommost uh, plate in that uh, mirror assembly. And then when we apply a potential to the mirror, then uh, those sinusoidal potentials pr um, are formed on top of the the, gr the grating. So now let's go back and revisit the, um, the proof of principle experiment that I showed earlier for the flat mirror. And now let's take a look and see what happens if we uh, replace the flat mirror with this topographical grading or the diffractive mirror. What would happen is that um, the electron that comes down not only gets reflected, but it also gets diffracted. And all those diffracted beams get refocused on the, on the sample plane again. So you can imagine if we used to get one image of the bottom surface before, now we're expecting multiple images of the bottom surface. Now because we have multiple um, focused beams on the bottom surface. So this is the kind of image that we would um, expect to see, the one on the uh, bottom right. And um, so a, central, um, a central brighter image because of the zeroth order uh, diffracted beam. And some, um, some fainter um, reflected images um, with some um, some with some displacement displacement from 
the, the central image. However, this, this image I actually created artificially. I just took this uh, central image and, um, and, 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 and kind of copied it and pasted it on either side with a little bit of shift just to see the kind of image that we would expect. So this is artificially generated. But now let's, um, let's see what would happen if we actually do this experiment and see what would happen actually. And this is what would happen. This is an actual experiment. The cantilever on the left is the top surface, and the, can and the, and the image on the right is produced when uh, the reflected image is, uh, is also diffracted. So we have multiple focus beam on the bottom surface. And uh, this is the kind of image that we would see. You would, uh, and you see it's very similar to what we would expect. We have a central uh, brighter image um, surrounded by, in this case, two other little fainter um, um, images with some um, displacement. Um, now let's look, take, a, take a look at the orientation of the fraction grating. In this case, um, it's um, so the point of looking at the orientation of the fraction grating is the fact that we know that the fraction spots um, should show up um, along a line orthogonal to the direction of the diffraction grating. And in this case, you see uh, they actually do. Uh, this direction is orthogonal to the direction of the uh, diffraction grating. Um, however, now, here's another here's another example. Um, you can see these um, repeated, fairly sharp lines showing up, and uh, this is again an evidence for diffraction. Uh, if you zoom out a little bit, you see that it's not only on one side. These lines are showing on both sides of the of the reflected image, which you would expect because we have not only positive orders of diffraction, we have the negative orders of diffraction, and they would all um, um, contribute to um, these repeated images. But one of the problems that we're experiencing in this case is look at the direction of, of the, or, or the orientation of the diffractive mirror in this case, or diffraction gratings. Uh, they're fairly vertical, so we would expect the repeated images to appear along a completely horizontal direction. And although there is a horizontal direction or a component to these repeated images in this case, there's definitely some or a little bit of um, uh, component in the vertical direction. These are the images are getting repeated um, in, a, um, in, uh, in the vertical direction as well, uh, although less, but still th it exists. Uh, this is a source of confusion at this point, as, at this point for us, because the chamber is um, the SEM chamber should be free of any magnetic field, so we are not expecting any rotation of the electron, reflected electron, due to magnetic field. Although there is uh, some magnetic field, very faint, there might be some magnetic field that we haven't measured yet, uh, which could cause this rotation. Uh, we still need to investigate this more to be able to confirm um, if it's in fact the, the, the magnetic, is if in fact there is any magnetic field in the chamber. Or um, alternatively, this could be uh, some sort of aberration, some sort of aberration that we haven't seen before in the, in the image or in the, in the beam that produces these uh, uh, repeated images with fairly sharp uh, lines. Uh, that would suggest that it, this might not be diffraction if, that's, uh, if, if the source of this kind of image is, is aberration, but we still have to uh, confirm. We haven't seen uh, any kind of aberration that would produce these images. Uh, that's why it's, um, it points towards diffraction at this point. So uh, these are some of the more some of the remaining concerns that we had. Um, I already mentioned the grading um, orientation. The, uh, the other concern we have is the image separation uh, between the, that, the, the image separation between these repeated images. Um, if we know that the Broglie wavelength of the electron and we know the pitch of the grating, we can find the diffraction angle. And if we know the distance between the mirror and the, and the sample, uh, then we can, using that angle, we can find this, the diffraction spot separation. And in this case, it's roughly about uh, 750 nanometers. But if you look at the image, uh, you can see that separation between these images, uh, or reflected images, is um, almost twice that amount, uh, or a little bit more than twice that amount, which at this point, uh, at this point we can't fully explain. And ultimately, we need a, we need a high-resolution numerical simulation to confirm the amount of phase shift that we're getting. So we need to actually make sure that with the current uh, setup, with the current electric field, and with the current um, um, diffraction gratings that we have, uh, we can produce enough phase shift that could cause uh, diffraction. That's still um, underway, and we're working on that as well. 
So before I leave you, I would like to leave you with one of the cooler applications of uh, diffractive electron mirrors. Um, this uh, application is in uh, electron wave function engineering, and, it's, uh, and it could be use, used in low-dose electron microscopy. Uh, so there was an idea that uh, Hiroshi Okamoto um, proposed in 2006, and the idea is that, um, it, it, I, and then he repeated, he um, um, extended that idea to, from transmission to reflection two years later. But I think I'll start by talking about transmission first, just because it's easier to explain. Uh, you can imagine a plane wave of electron coming in, interacting with a sample, with a phase object. That object will modify the wave function of the electron. So this, the psi naught here, or psi O, uh, is the modified um, wave function of the, the, the probe electron. And then if we have a diffractive element here, a transmission diffractive element that has a, has a structure or pattern that uh, is exactly the inverse Fourier trans transform of this uh, modified uh, wave function, then we can expect the, the beam that goes through to be focused on a spot on our detector. That's the psi s. So if that's the case, if by placing this uh, transmission uh, diffractive element, we get to focus the, uh, the electron, then we can be sure that we guess the structure of the sample correctly. The, the structure of the, diffractive, of the diffractive element is exactly the inverse for a transform of the sample. However, if we guess the, the structure wrongly and uh, we place the wrong diffractive element here, what would happen is that not, we cannot focus the, the modified wave function. What would happen, we actually further scatter the wave function and we would not see on the detector uh, the electron being focused on a spot. So then by, uh, by uh, using this system, uh, we can get yes or no, yes or no answers to th the guesses we make about the structure of the sample with only one um, electron. So this is, that's why the idea of low-dose electron microscopy is the fact that uh, if we guess it correctly, if you have some ideas of what the structure might be and guess it correctly, with one electron in potential, we can, potentially we can guess what the structure might be. This could be also done in reflection. Um, so, th so I've, I've highlighted a part of this figure that says pixel-wise phase shifter. That pixel-wise phase shifter basically replaces uh, the transmission um, diffractive element. And um, uh, Okamoto calls it a pixel-wise phase shifter because he, assume, he pictures it to be um, a dynamic, uh, a, a, a structure that could be dynamically changed and uh, produce different phase shifts um, of the electron. So you can imagine an electron coming in um, from, from the left getting separated, getting ref directed towards this pixel-wise phase shifter. And this pixel-wise phase shifter would impart some complex uh, phase shift on the, on the electron or modify the wave, function of the wave function of the electron in an arbitrary way. So what I've been showing so far is, is actually exactly that, um, uh, the simplest case of that, which is um, a linear 1D diffraction grating which imparts um, sinusoidal uh, phase modulations. But this could be as arbitrary as as uh, one wants. So after imparting that phase shift on the electron and modifying the, phase, uh, the wave function, the electron gets reflected and gets directed towards a sample and uh, the same as the similar situation as the transmission case. If that phase shift is correct, um, after interaction with the sample, the electron would get, uh, f would get focused on, the, on one spot on the detector. So again, if our guess is correct, then with one electron, with a single electron, we get to uh, guess this. We, can, we get to know or, or re reconfirm the structure of the sample. And if it's uh, not the correct guess, we can uh, dynamically change this uh, pixel-wise phase shifter to um, to repeat the experiment and uh, have a second guess or more. So in conclusion, we've demonstrated. Um, electron mirrors in, in an SEM. We've demonstrated simultaneous imaging of top and bottom surface of a sample. We've developed uh, and fabricated diffractive electron mirrors. And uh, we have some preliminary results of, um, of, uh, of, of diffractive uh, electron mirrors um, having multiple images of the bottom surface of the sample at the same time. Uh, but these results are still to be confirmed. Thank you for your attention.